Hello all, welcome to the Wayne State University webinar as part of the summer doctoral seminar that is hosted by the Department of Communication. Uh, in the department, we have hosted this uh, seminar face-to-face -face, uh, on site uh, for many years. And as you can imagine, uh, the reason why we are going online to a webinar format this year. Uh, but in a way, it's been uh, a positive thing since uh, now we are reaching almost uh, 300 people across the world. Uh, so this year, uh, our, uh, we, we are um, focusing on uh, chaos at the intersection of crisis and health, navigating the paradox of communicating certainty in uncertain times, which is a very timely topic given the current pandemic. And uh, we are pleased to have Dr. Tim Selnow as our seminar leader, as well as the speaker uh, for this webinar. Uh, to tell us more, uh, I'll pass it on to our department chair, Dr. Catherine uh, McGuire, and uh, to you, Kat. Thank you very much, Pradeep. And thank you for all the work that you've done to get organized this year's seminar and the, this tonight's event. And we've been doing this series since 2006, which this makes this our 14th annual seminar, but our first virtual one. I also want to extend thanks to Gary Sandrowski and Chris Galisi in the Dean's Office for their technical support for the event, as well as Dr. Daria Lefebvre, who helped set up the Canvas site that allowed the seminar to happen virtually and has provided support throughout the week. And of course, thank you to Tim for being this year's seminar leader. I can't think of a better person or topic. Now, it is my honor to introduce Dean Matthew Seeger. Dean Seeger joined our department in 1983, and since that time, he's taken significant leadership positions throughout Wayne State University, serving as assistant dean of the graduate school, as well as department chair. And in 2010, Dean Seeger uh, went to the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts as the interim dean and has been there since then, leading us through some of the most challenging times we've had. And indeed, I couldn't be more thankful to have him in the position as he leads us through the COVID-19 pandemic. He's a natural. Like Dr. Selnow, Dean Seeger has been a leader in the areas of risk and crisis, working closely with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the Department of Homeland Security. He has also been a member of Wayne State University's President's Coronavirus Committee. He has published at least 11 books and well over 100 peer-reviewed articles on crisis and crisis communication. But despite, and despite his significant administrative duties, he continues to do research and mentor graduate students as they become the next generation of risk and crisis scholars. So it is my pleasure to now welcome Dean Seeger, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you very much, Kat. I really appreciate the chance to speak to the group today and, and introduce uh, my friend, my colleague, uh, and my co-author on many, many projects, uh, Tim Salnow. Tim is a Professor of Strategic Communication at the Nicholson School of Communication and Media at the University of Central Florida, a center uh, of crisis communication and risk communication research. He is one of the leading scholars and really a thought leader in the whole field of crisis and risk communication. In addition to serving as a corporate consultant, he has conducted funded research for the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Environmental Protection Agency, the United States Ge Geographical Geological Survey, and the World Health Organization. He has also served in an advisory role to the National Academy of Sciences the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, and he's published over 200 refereed journal articles and co-authored six books on crisis and risk communication. His work on chaos theory and crisis communication and the idea model of instructional crisis communication has significantly expanded the parameters of this field. He is the recipient of the National Communication Association's Gerald M. Phillips Award for Distinguished Applied Communication Research and is past editor of the Journal of Applied Communication Research. And most importantly, Tim is an alum of Wayne State University. So we're delighted to invite him back uh, for the seminar and we're anxious to hear his remarks today. So thank you, Tim. 
Thank you, Matt. And I, I say with all sincerity that whatever success I have had in my career, it certainly would have been less if I had not had the good sense to choose Wayne State University to earn my PhD in communication. I'm grateful for what I learned and I'm grateful for this opportunity and for all the assistance the faculty has given in planning this event and in bringing the students online and creating this event. And, and a special thanks to Daria Laflave, who spent many hours with me trying to make sure that this was a meaningful experience for our students online. Several decades ago, my wife Deanna and I uh, made the choice to start our career and our family in North Dakota. We took jobs at North Dakota State University and we quickly learned that the prairie is a harsh place to live. One of our early experiences was driving home from uh, back to Fargo from a Christmas experience at our, with our in-laws, with my in-laws. Driving home, we learned what a ground blizzard is. A ground blizzard is when wind picks up snow and makes portions of the road completely whited out. We drove into one of these events and we could not see ahead of us, behind us, or beside us. All we could do is crack open the door, look for the road, make sure our, our tires were on road, not ditch, and move close and move forward. We didn't know where we were, we didn't know how long it would last, and we didn't know what to do. It was a new experience. This is a lot of what we experience when we look at, at, at chaotic episodes in our lives. And I, I, I looking at, at much of what we're going through now is, is parts of a, a chaotic experience. And I'm reminded in a, in a way, many of us are looking for books and things to read and reflect on as we go through this experience. One of the books I read uh, upon moving to North Dakota is Giants in the Earth. And in this book written in 1927, Rolveg tells the story of the very first people to turn the soil and plant a crop in the Dakotas. They traveled, they were, they were on in uncharted territory. They experienced pandemics, natural disasters, grass fires, and, and they experienced disease and loneliness, all these things together, some of which we're experiencing now. And I'd like to think about both the chaos of going someplace so new, so confusing, and the, the, the harshness that, that we experience in things like blizzards and, and ground blizzards when we lose our, our contact with, with what we know uh, as, as a guide for, for how we can reflect on understanding why people are so eager for information and why they struggle when we can't give publics the information that, that they, they need to have. Our path forward, I'd like to guide us with a chaos theory, working through, the, the, through each of these elements of chaos, but also as a bit of a guide, giants in the earth, because I feel like the experience written about in this book that, that so moved me, uh, helps me understand some of the chapters that we're going through and that we will go through. I'll talk about bifurcation, fractals, strange attractors, and self-organization. And then I'll introduce some of the philosophies that, that Dr. Seeger, that others, myself, have advanced in a discourse of renewal to better understand how we might move through that self-organization process more effectively. So let's get started. Chapter one is bifurcation. And Wilbig writes about the, the characters who enter South Dakota, and he says that, this, the, that the plains were desolate and that they called forth all that was evil in human nature. They experienced their first prairie grass fire. They experienced their first blizzard of such magnitude in the cold winters, and they went through what, they would, what I would call a bifurcation. In other words, their understanding of what life would be and should be and could be came apart for them. In other words, bifurcation is when our understanding of reality no longer matches what's going on around us. When we were in our car in our first and, and really only ground blizzard that we were ignorant enough to drive into as new residents of North Dakota, we went through what we would call from a chaotic perspective, 
bifurcation as a cosmology episode where we didn't know what was happening, we didn't know what to do, and we didn't know what to, uh, who could help us. And what we also didn't know is where would we get more information? How would we understand this? And once we got through this moment on the road where we couldn't see how many more would happen, we were, we were concerned, we were worried, and I'll, I, I'll, I'll tell a happy ending of the story, we did get home okay. But that cosmology episode is what we're experiencing now for many people. To see a pandemic, a lot of us who study health communication or crisis communication have known that 1918 could repeat itself at any time. But a lot of people don't know that. And this is something that they're having a very difficult time understanding, and it is a cosmology episode. And we have to accept that. When we go through a cosmology episode, we can want to, to bounce forward and be better for what we experienced and, and learn from it, or bounce back and think, how can I protect myself, be resilient, not have that happen again? This is a theme that I'll also carry through uh, this conversation. One of the most important books I've ever read is The Social Construction of Reality. And many of you on, the, on this webinar have read the same book. When this was recom recommended to me in graduate school, I, I told our graduate students in the seminar, I couldn't stop reading it. I didn't get any sleep that night. I couldn't stop reading it. This made so much sense. It answered so many of my questions. But a part of the social construction of reality deals with the deconstruction or alternations. Berger and Luckman talk about how when that reality is challenged, we go through alternations. Crises produce alternations. In other words, our existing explanation of reality bifurcates. It doesn't exist. It can no longer function effectively. The interactive process in, in, that, in that coming to know a bifurcation or an alternation is something that creates a dependence on leadership. We look for people who can guide us through that. Berger and Luckman believe that that there would be leaders who would lead that discussion in alternations. And once we get to an alternation, begin to establish it, the question becomes, can we maintain this, this new vision, this new reality? Can we maintain this plausibility over time? These are heavy questions posed by Berger and Luckman, but they're questions we're asking right now. now who will lead us through this? And what, when we get to a, a new reality, will we be able to sustain it or will we try to gravitate and bounce back? This is a spoiler alert for me and, and showing my bias, and that is that I think we need to move forward through these events. As Einstein said, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. We create our realities. They no longer represent what happens around us, and we need to change. Quite frankly, from a chaos theory perspective, we understand that nature knows exactly what it's doing. We impose our own order on nature, and then when we realize that order no longer fits what, na what, what nature is going to do and will do and always has been doing, it's time to change. Chapter two, fractals. When we go through a bifurcation moment, we seek information and we find it and cling to it and we try to understand. And sometimes we want all the information immediately and most times, it takes time, it takes thought, it takes analysis for that information to appear or for us to make sense of it. When the people moved to South Dakota for the first time and they, and they looked over the great land that they saw, they knew no one had ever dwelt there. They came without advice. They were the first people to plant a seed in that area. It was so void and vast that they, they, they talk about how Songbirds weren't even there yet because people hadn't planted the trees and the kind of crops that, that would sustain them. Silence, nothing but wind and grass. When we start seeing fractals, we feel desolate ourselves. We're trying to understand them. We're so confused. We don't know which way to go. We're waiting for the patterns to emerge. We try to be prudent with that information to try to understand what's happening. We try to do that, but there's always a cost in time. The longer it takes for us to get that information out to people, the more likely we'll have opportunities created for misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. When I talk about misinformation, I'm talking about misunderstanding those fractals, 
disinformation, maybe people will manipulate those fractals to try to create dissension and malinformation. Sometimes we steal information or people steal information and use it for ways unintended. These are all problems that we can see frequently. When you look at it, the cost of time. I, I, I'm so troubled by how new media has created opportunities for, for uh, claims of crisis denial. I know that we went through a, a very difficult time in, in Parkland High School, very close to Orlando, where uh, Deanna and I teach. And the first response was that the children, that, they, that these kids, these, these teenage kids that were responding and calling out for change were called crisis actors. And the same strategy had been used repeatedly. Alex Jones did the same thing in Sandy Hook to the point where he would broadcast the addresses of families that, that, were, that were grieving their children and claiming that they too were crisis actors. And of course, pandemic had its own complications and the, the consistent feature is that once each of these elements, that the hopeful feature is that once each of these elements of I think disinformation or misinformation were, were made, made public or the awareness was, was, was made very strong, then, then social media platforms took down a lot of these messages. And so it's just a sign of the difficulty, the challenges, the cost of time when we're looking at the fractals that are produced by bifurcation. Matt mentioned some of the work we've done with the idea model. And the idea model is trying to counteract that cost of time. We try to come up with a simple, clear way to communicate information consistently and, and clearly that's cognitive, affective, and behavioral in nature. The model simply argues that we need to help people understand who's at risk. That's the internalization. We need to help people understand an explanation of what's happening. But we also have done a good deal of research that, that makes us realize that's where it stops too often with a lot of explanation and not really getting to those actions. What can people do now, even if the first step is simple? Distribution, we have to get this information out on the same resources or the same channels that people turn to. And they don't turn to the same channels that they used to turn to. We've had to adapt as, as communicators of public health, as crisis communicators in general. This model is simple, and we've used it to the point where uh, my, my wife uh, is also a, a professor. Deanna had a major project with the United States Geological Survey uh, that, where they were able to turn this into a phone app uh, to turn earthquake warning, early warning, into a phone app that within could provide eight second warnings to people, giving them enough time to understand if they were at risk based on a map, how much time they had, and what they needed to do to, to drop cover and hold on. These are the kinds of action statements that can be communicated using or going to the people with the very technology that they're most comfortable with. And of course, we see the same thing possibly happening with our, our, our efforts to develop a trace and track program. This has worked successfully in other countries. There's been a lot of pushback in the United States. Nevertheless, this is the kind of fractal interpretation and communication that we're capable of and that I strongly advocate. And we think we can do it with, with models like the IDEA approach. We have our fractals, we have some information. We move on to chapter three, strange attractors. What brings people together to help cope with and solve some of these problems, bringing us together instead of pulling us apart. We're bifurcated, we're fearful, we've gone through a crisis that brings us together our common values. And I know that, that as the residents, the new residents of South Dakota walked through the prairie and bent down the grass for the first time it had ever met a human foot, they saw beauty because they saw their future. What they knew is that no place else were they able to get this much land with soil this rich and to start a new beginning that held them together. They formed communities. The places they stopped and collaborated on the prairie are towns that still exist today. And it's a wonderful history. And it's a coming together of people based on their values. But the attractors may be strange in that we may come together in ways we had not anticipated. 
We may depend upon people that we didn't even consider before. We may be helping someone that wasn't even on our awareness level prior to the crisis. That is the beauty of a crisis response, but there's more, there's challenges. This can go in both directions. Uh, we can bounce forward or we can bounce backward. We can create unity or we can create division. Let's think about that in a couple of examples. An example I'm proud to, to play a small part in happens with a strange attractor bringing together parties from multiple places on the globe to deal with the mudslide challenge in, in the Baduta district on the border of Uganda and Kenya. These groups of people, scientists, communication people, are coming together to help a population who farms on the mountain, produces rich crops, but every day realizes that in heavy rain, their lives could be lost. You look at this, some of these pictures that I'm posting, after a night of rain, one house can survive and the one next to it can be pushed down the mountain and the person will be buried for the rest of their life. This is a, a challenge that people are facing. There's no reward for some of the people that are, are very little reward other than engaging in an ethic of care, a strange attractor for the faculty members that you can see here from Uganda Christian University who travel up the rigorous hike to the top of the mountain and talk to these farmers, trying to help them understand where to relocate. And now talk to them about relocation and opportunities in an age of, of COVID-19 when they might be moving to a more dangerous or exposing themselves to these problems. What I see in a case like this is people coming together with that, that humanism, that humanism, that ethic of care, and it's beautiful. And they're coming together in tragedy. And this is something that's remarkable, remarkable about, about us as people. But we also get angry in crisis situations. And we come together in, in many ways, sometimes we're, we're producing change. I'm, I, I know that, that in Michigan, there were some very, very uh, angry people. We've talked about that in the seminar. Did not feel that they had the, that, that they felt their rights were being challenged by, by staying at home during COVID-19. These were, these were uh, very angry protests, very difficult times. At the same time, you had a lot of energy expended by young people on, on that were communicating what I would say strange attractors trying to unite each other, saying that we need to stay home, let's do our part. We're at a far less risk, but let's not hurt other people. It's a great story that was shared on Pandemic Pedagogy. It's a, a site that, that, a social media site that's gone on through the COVID-19 about a picture that someone took of a professor near the end of his career who sat a small doll on the front desk and, it, and he engaged then, created his, uh, uh, recorded for the first time, a lecture that was shared online with his students. And he said to his students, I put this, this doll here because I feel funny speaking in an empty room. And he delivered his whole lecture to the eyes of this, this one doll. And one of his students wrote, and this is the post that, that went, uh, that went, had many, many views, said, I'm really touched by this, by what he's doing for us and I'm staying home just for this guy. That's the kind of strange attractors and values that I see people engaging. So we're coming together, we're coming apart. We know this is, is the challenge that we face from crises. But we move to chapter four, and that is self-organization, coming together. I love this line from Giants in the Earth where it talks about all the different challenges and pestilence that these, that these, these first farmers experienced, but they also knew that they had a story to tell and that it was a tale of success and creation of, a, of an agricultural kingdom from which they had no anticipation of how great it could really be. And they worked together and they united this in this effort. And that's the kind of, of productivity that we see with self-organization in response to a crisis. And that's really the, the culmination, the positive part uh, that we can see from a, from a chaotic episode and that chaos theory tells us to watch for. A couple of examples I thought I'd share. This is a, a remarkable example that, that uh, Deanna and I have had a, had a chance to spend some time with, and that is the Meet the Helpers program. And I hope those of you with small children who watch public television 
have seen some of these episodes. This all started in Orlando with a good idea that, that, that reflecting on Fred Rogers, who said that in, in frightening times, in tragic times, he went on the air to tell his children always that his viewers always look for the helpers. There are always helpers. And that's to calm the, and that's the calm that you can find in the storm. What happened is that we had a, a horrific event where, where nearly 50 individuals were gunned down by a single perpetrator one night, June 12th, uh, in Orlando, uh, four years ago. And this is horrific. And the, the loss was, it was, was painful. We saw the, the community respond. We were, it was, it was, it was a, it was an act of, uh, against our LGBTQ community. And it was, and it was hurtful. And we were reeling. And the people at, at, at the WUCF wanted to do something. And this is what they came up with. Their first response was, meet the helpers. What would Fred Rogers say? And they created a video that talked about disasters and, and how to look for the police and how they can be helpful, how to look for firefighters, what it means to have a, a position. They put these messages together. They were so successful that they shared them nationally. And now with COVID-19, they've developed a series of messages that are very helpful for kids to help them understand social distancing, help them understand what it means to, to respond effectively to a pandemic. And it's a great story, but it's self-organization. It's, it's this group wanting to solve a problem. And then it's other stations, on, uh, PBS stations, wanting to collaborate, share the message, and communicate, and, and actually to contribute resources to the further development of the program. Marvelous example of, of self-organization. And then the distribution of food. Never in my lifetime have so many Americans been hungry. And that is so painful in, in, a, in a land like ours that, that people could be so hungry, but restaurants who couldn't prepare their food or couldn't, that, it, were, that had excess food were giving it away. Restaurants were preparing meals and giving them away. That, that people at, at, that, that are, would normally be selling their food at, at, the, at the fairs on each of the, on, each, on a weekly basis, were contributing their food to food banks, new food banks, churches, uh, other clubs were creating food banks that didn't exist before. And all of this to try to satisfy this need and estimates of nearly 20 million people who had never been to a food bank who'd still be hungry and in need of food. This is self-organization. This is those, that kind of strange attractor. This is seeing the evidence and responding. And, and it's something that, that gives us hope. But chapter five is self-organization that will continue. What is the chapter that we're writing right now? That's what, I'm, that's what I pose for us as I, as I wind down this presentation. And I thought about it. Well, well we're looking at self-organization and renewal seem to be a good explanation for how to bounce forward. Uh, we're bouncing back. We're trying to return to what we were. See, it wasn't as bad as I said it was, but it has been bad. One death is too many, but 100,000 deaths, it has been bad. People have been hungry. People have been in need of care. People have been lonely. This is, this is challenging, and we have a chapter yet to write. And I wanted to talk about that through renewal because I, what, I see this as a way for us to bounce forward and to encourage the kind of, of self-organization that I've already talked about and given examples to share. Really, when you look at this theory that that Dr. Seeger developed, you've got four elements, uh, a prospective vision, leadership, shared values, learning. I should also say Dr. Ulmer played a major role in creating this theory. So this is, these are elements that are essential and central to what I think is getting at the very important self-organization. But first of all, let's talk about that prospective vision. This isn't a vision of getting back to normal. This isn't a vision of, of Turn to the way things were. We often talk about going through a crisis as saying that we're now we're stronger in, in broken places, but that's not the that's not the way Ernest Hemingway wrote it in A Farewell to Arms. He talked about how crises or the world breaks everyone. It breaks us all, and if we're unwilling to pro, to, to to give in to that kind of a, a process, uh, you know, we're only setting ourselves up for future disaster. The world will only be harder on us. So we need to change and it's bigger, it's stronger, it's more than just getting through it. 
it's changing, it's growing, it's being stronger in new ways. That prospective vision is, is a new way of thinking. It's not a loss or a defeat because we had to change. It's okay to pause and mourn, and we should, and we are, and we've lost something. We've lost a lot. But pausing to blame is something that, that is completely counter to the entire renewal process. The focus is not on moving forward if we're trying to figure out who's at fault, who's wrong, and who's arguing incorrectly. It's rather coming together through this process of strange attractors and self-organization to move forward and create a vision for the future. Here's an example for those of you at, at Wayne State University, all you have to do is look at your own campus. As you, as you look at your, your president and Tony Holt creating or, or moving forward their national de-escalation training center. This is something that in response to, to the kind of tensions we're feeling right now after George Floyd's senseless murder, but we're looking at this. This is a pro uh, project that was underway well ahead of that. This is something that is in response to a need, but the project is one that is built on those kinds of strange attractors that bring people together. And this is a center that has aspirations to go out nationally and to be shared. But most importantly, this is a center that is existing. It's not waiting for, uh, for, for an existing leader or someone to, to, to say it's okay or this is what we're going to do. This is emergent leadership. And that often happens with renewal. Someone stepping forward, in this case, it's Wayne State University stepping forward, creating this training center. This is self-organization and it's being done with emergent leadership. And that's what I'm watching for. That's what I'm expecting and hoping to see. And it's beautiful. Shared values coming together. This is also a part of renewal. And the process involves a dialogue, but this dialogue is, is, a, is a tenuous one. It's not one of, of, of competing sides. It's an example that we might see in, in some cases and not in other cases, but we're seeing it in Minneapolis. There was a vote yesterday that on Sunday night that uh, the, the city council of Minneapolis will disband its police department and put it back together with a new system of public safety, working together with the community to fix a problem that's been very serious. And as, a, as someone who, who grew up in Minnesota, I know it's a problem there. And I know it needs work. And I think it's, and, I, and I'm reassured by the shared values, the coming together and the changes that, that will happen now. They will happen in, in Minneapolis. And learning is so important. Uh, that's a part of the renewal process where we learn from what we've gone through and, and so that we have the knowledge to move forward. Despite the criticism that's happened uh, against the, the World Health Organization, you will notice an outpouring of support. Uh, many of us in this, in, at, at, in this room I mean, or on this call have participated in World uh, Health Organization projects. I know that, that uh, Deep and, and uh, Julie Novak and others at, at Wayne State. Uh, Matt Seeger's been a major leader in the World Health Organization's initiative. Now, I've been a part of it uh, to, to move forward and develop a risk protocol. This was in place well before COVID-19. The understanding is that there will be pandemics. We were in Geneva three years ago talking about the preparation for pandemics. And this was an effort that was underway long ago and will continue. So to stop and criticize the World Health Organization, for whatever accusations there are, this is to, to freeze and to stop a renewal, a self-organization process that has been underway for years now to try to understand how to better report pandemics to move forward. There is hope, there is learning, there is self-organization, and it's global. So as we write that last chapter, what we're looking for is self-organization that produces tenable alternations getting back to, to Berger and Luckman. And if we commit to this process, we can build these kinds of an alternation that will make us more prepared for the next pandemic. And I don't wanna be negative, but there will be another pandemic because disease is a, is a fact of our life and it is something that is constantly evolving. But the questions are, can we commit to self-organization? Will we? And if we don't, uh, who will? We can't wait, this is our generation. We had since 1918 to get ready we got complacent. We now understand that, that this is a reality. And if we don't do it now, when will we do it? And I think this is a, a great example for, for change. A 
I began by talking about how we begin with, with no knowledge, uh, how for that moment in time, uh, we, left, we were suspended in animation. It, we didn't know where we were. We didn't know what was happening, but we drove through it. and We learned so much about what it means to live on, on the prairie, staying there for almost 20 years and to the point of understanding that with good knowledge and a good plan and good people to collaborate with, we created an experience there that I wouldn't trade for anything. And at this point, I hope that we can develop that same kind of experience and write that last chapter in a positive way. And I'm now open for, for questions. Thank you, Dr. Selma, for a very insightful lecture. I mean, it gives us a lot of food for thought, how to uh, theorize about such events as well as how to do uh, future research. Um, to, do, to all the participants in the webinar, if you have questions, uh, please post it in the Q&A and I'll uh, read them out to Dr. Selnow and he'll uh, answer them. Uh, we already had a couple of questions in the Q&A and I answered some of them there, but uh, for Dr. Selnow, uh, if you have questions, please uh, type them in there. Uh, Dr. Silnow, here's a question um, about leadership. Uh, I'm going to read it uh, verbatim. So I'm curious about unpacking a bit more on leadership. It is often treated quite uh, monolithically and centrally. I'm looking at, I think that I have a very broad view of leadership in a self-organization process and in the renewal process. I think that, that we are all empowered with moments of, of leadership. And I'm, I'm very dedicated to understanding some of the work that Morgan Getchell has done and others on building an awareness of emergent leadership, how in crises we can have people that, that are not even directly involved, but are able to share their resources. She wrote about how when there was a, a chemical spill in West Virginia that, that destroyed, that really created tremendous problems in the water supply, uh, that, Far, far less than, than in Flint, but, but very serious in, in West Virginia, how people were craving information and didn't feel like they could trust the local government. And professionals from across the country that understood water safety and, and water purification created a, 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 an online group, an emergent group, an emergent organization that shared information broadly. This is leadership from people who were not in the community and who could not come to the community but we're able to bring that information there. Uh, any time we volunteer in any way that makes progress toward the goals that we have set, we're engaging in leadership. And so I see leadership as, as a, from a very inclusive and grassroots perspective. Uh, second question, uh, it's a follow-up on uh, the leadership. Uh, uh, can you elaborate on the roles and types of leadership various people adopt? Oh, there's so many different, I, I guess it, it, it can be endless. And I'm, I'm looking at the point where there's leadership going on right now in, in some families and, and, and all families really were. And I think that's a bit about what, what Berger and Luckman were talking about is let's take a look at, at models that exist like the, like the social mediated crisis communication model that's being developed by uh, by uh, Lou and Austin and Yen, these are, this is a model that, that clearly indicates that when we're in a situation like this, we're getting information interpersonally. And that's where part of the leadership takes place. We're getting it online from our communities. That's where part of the leadership takes place. And we're getting it from our formal messaging that we receive in the, in, from different kinds of, of resources where we're, that communicate to us from our established agencies, government agencies and organizations. All of this comes together and creates a confluence of information that from which we make our decisions and, and build our, our new directions. So this is, is clearly a, a very inclusive view. Okay. Uh, next question, how can we incorporate a global protocol in time of crisis? One that takes into consideration 
uh, vastly different cultural traditions. Well, that's a, and this is something that, this is a question that, that we've lived, those of us who work with the World Health Organization. Uh, interesting, uh, we, in November, uh, uh, was in uh, Cairo, uh, Deanna spoke at a meeting with the Mediterranean region of the World Health Organization and talked a lot about some of the different kinds of crises that, that they're facing. And these some have to do with the changing climate in that there are now mosquito diseases spreading in regions where, where they, they had, had no malaria before. There are lots of problems going on. And as we listened and, and talked, the realization that, that, that I came away with was understanding how important it is to understand issues. Some of these countries were, were war torn and the, the, the war itself was, was limiting the kind of crisis resolution that they could engage in, they, that they could even to the distribution of resources as simple as food, much less vaccination. Some, in some cases, the, there, there was so little communication, so little infrastructure in parts of some countries that getting the area, getting the need there is a big challenge. The thing that I would say is that first of all, we need to recognize that, that there is this diversity and need and we need to address it and we need to be culturally centered, looking at some of Mohan Duda's work, to take that message to the people and let them be participative in providing those solutions and tell us what's wrong and tell us what's not happening and tell us where we're falling short. And that is a, the, the objective that, that I see. Uh, next question. Uh, when thinking about misinformation during a crisis, is it best to acknowledge and respond to it directly or try to simply drown it out? Um, I guess it's a question of deframing versus reframing. Uh, which one do you think is more effective? I wish I knew how to deframe. Uh, I, I know I've, I've certainly uh, seen people try. Uh, I think that there's a, a tendency for for uh, that void to be filled. There's, so, there's something comforting apparently, uh, something psychologically comforting in a conspiracy theory, for example, that gives us all the answers. So I do believe that, that sharing the information that is counter to that, those kinds of, of, of uh, assaults on, on what I believe is the, are, are the facts or the evidence is important. And it, it's critical. There is a there is a percentage of the population that will always believe that there is a conspiracy, that there is a plan, and and we have to accept that. That's that's what we're up against. However, when I see a couple of things happen, I, I'm heartened, and I, I would consider these forms of self-organization. That I, I've seen some of uh, the work that Melissa Dodd and others have done have shown how organizations that engage in this sort of uh, post-crisis corporate social responsibility actually creates for them a better uh, image, a better, uh, they even, sales even go up. And that's not why I, I think people should do it, but I'm trying to say that the evidence is there. When a, when a, when a company like Dick's Sporting Goods stops selling assault rifles because they believe that it's unethical and then stop selling guns altogether, that's millions and millions of dollars lost. But a lot of respect earned from their, from their publics. So I see that kind of an, of an example as, as promising. I see trying to get uh, information out on, on the, that, that is to counter some of what goes on on the web. And, I, and we all know that we need to encourage media literacy. I've watched in my own family, people who are more media savvy or more understanding, reaching out to people who are less media savvy or have, are newer to social media and trying to help them understand what it means, why, why uh, something like pandemic is, is in their newsfeed and, and what that means and, and why they need to, to better understand that. I see that as, as, as sharing media literacy and I see that at a grassroots level. But I also see something like Alex Jones being taken down, having his show taken down off of YouTube because of, of the the assaults and the attacks, and I've seen the successful lawsuits by the Sandy Hook parents brought against him. So that's a long answer to a, to a very complicated question. 
There are a couple of questions regarding um, post-crisis learning and renewal. Instead of uh, maybe combining the questions, uh, perhaps you can just share your thoughts about renewal and uh, post-crisis learning. About about renewal and, and learning and, and how they come together? Yeah, post-crisis learning. Yeah. Post-crisis learning. And obviously, the learning is the, is the key from, from a crisis event. And the, the question is, can we take those lessons and put them into action. And the point is that with renewal theory, it's not just learning theory over again. It talks about the need for leadership and strong ethical based value driven leadership, a vocal present leader that has a prospective vision. And that's how you move an organization forward. And that research is, is, is quite clear. Look at, at situations like a, a I, I, I think of a, a chaotic event where uh, a, a, a collection of, of the silt that builds up from, from coal was stored in Tennessee and the Tennessee Valley Authority had it, in a, had it stored the, the banks of this, of this pool of, of ash and flooded a community. Uh, thankfully, no one died, but the community was devastated. Some of that learning that, that took place changed the procedure, the entire process that, that because of the, the care and, and investigation and openness that was, was brought on by the Tennessee Valley Authority in response to that event, really created new lessons that were part of a prospective vision that changed the way the Tennessee Valley Authority tests its dams, works with the process, and, and, and all of its procedures were started at, at the very beginning. And I think that's another, uh, another situation of, of learning just how, how troubled the Minneapolis Police Department was to the point where it needs to be taken apart and put, to, put back together in a new way. So keep in mind that with renewal, it's not just another form of organizational learning, it's leadership and it's leadership for a prospective positive change. Um, and I am, I'm paraphrasing the question here. Um, what do you see the relationship between uh, taking a chaos uh, theory perspective and ethics? Well, you know, it, it, it depends on, on, on your perspective. There are some people who see chaos theory uh, as, as truth or, or what's, what's really happening. And then their, their ethic is to try to understand how to work with nature. Um, that's an ethic. There is a, a, another, uh, another school of thought with chaos theory would be to understand ethics as what occurs in that strange attractor moment. And, and, and really, what is ethical? It depends on who you are and what your experiences are. And I do not want to debate that. That's, that's, a, that's a talk for another day. But I think what there is a lot that goes on in, in what, what people value and that crises we've talked about in the seminar are epistemological. We learn things about our community, about our organization, and about our capacity for crisis management that we could not have known uh, and that we wouldn't even anticipate it. But uh, crises are also reveal our, our axiology, our value structures, our failures uh, to account for the needs of, of, of some people in our community, our successes that keep us together. And so ethics become, uh, from a crisis standpoint or a chaos standpoint, First of all, it reveals our axiology, and secondly, it gives us a, a, a perhaps a, a roadmap for how we can come together. And again, I'm uh, kind of combining a couple of questions and paraphrasing them. Um, so crises, uh, multiple crises can happen at the same time or multiple, um, uh, you know, Societal events can be happening at the same time, for example, the current coronavirus uh, crisis and the BLM movement. Uh, so what relations do you see between the two, uh, maybe specifically about these two, but in general about how multiple crises can happen simultaneously? Uh, and is there a relationship in, the, in terms of a causal, uh, does one crisis fuel the other or how, how, how do the relationships work between the multiple crises? Well, I think that, that what we've been talking about from a crisis communication perspective is a, a cascading effect of, of crises and that 
multiple crises occur. We're, we're looking at the, the, with COVID-19, what I would call a, a mega crisis. It's global, it's slow, it's long. We don't know when it will end. We'll come up with a vaccine. But how will that vaccine work? When will it work? How will we distribute that? This is a long crisis. So there are bound to be other events that happen at the same time. I'm really concerned living in Florida about hurricane season because when the hurricane comes and people evacuate, we oftentimes open up centers where people are able to go and, and find self-protection and, and they can shelter from the storm and their houses aren't safe and they simply need to come to these shelters. How are we going to social distance in those shelters? And will people fail to come to the shelter if we have a hurricane in the next August, for example, maybe even late July, it's happened in the past, will they be afraid to come? And will they put their lives in peril because they're, they will stay at home? This, this is something that, that, that concerns me. And this is a, another point of a, a cascading effect. With, the, with Black Lives Matter, this is something that's important and it can't stop and it's ongoing. And this is something that never, that, that never left the center of the of, of focus of many people. So for me to say that this is, is coming up now, it, it has some relation to COVID-19, this has never stopped. It's a problem. This has been a problem and this is a very serious problem. And for, for, for many people, uh, for the, the question would be, what does COVID-19 have to do with the, with the Black Lives Matter movement? And so that's probably a better way to ask it for, for me and we'll say, well, it, it, it just shows more of the social injustice and disparity that, that needs to be addressed and I, I'm passionate about it. Thanks. Um, next question, uh, could you comment on the role of listening in response to crises? I think that this is, uh, this is uh, uh, I, I just want to, I don't know who asked this question, but I'm grateful that you asked it because this is the message that I keep telling myself that the first thing that, that we all need to do right now is, is listen. And I'm not unfriending people on Facebook and I'm not, you know, doing, uh, shutting down and taking a break from social media, but I'm trying to listen. And uh, 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 one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Adam Parrish spends a lot of time working on nonviolent theory, at, at nonviolent communication. And the biggest thing that we do in, in a nonviolent perspective, and at least the, the angle that he takes on that, is to listen and understand the unmet needs of people. And that's, what, that's where it has to start. And when we look at people who are upset, we had a wonderful discussion talking about how people in, in Northern Michigan see things very differently and they're at a very different level of risk. And so we need to listen to them and understand what upset them, what drove them to, to, to engage in these kinds of protests. And surely there's, there's some problems, but part of listening means that we don't, we don't lock ourselves down into our echo, an echo chamber and only listen to people that, that say what we're saying but rather to listen to others. And the second is that we don't engage in synecdoche. In other words, we don't look at the most problematic person, the person we dislike the most, and claim that that is a generalization for all of those who, who we, we are opposed to. We don't even, we don't do that. We realize that people are people and there are always problems, no matter what side you're on, but that we start to listen and we start to, to view people for who they are instead of trying to, to, to use some sort of a hasty generalization. Thank you. Um, again, I'm looking across a couple of questions. Uh, would you comment on the place of emotion in self-organizing? This is really important. There's some very good research being done on emotion. Uh, it's, it's tough research to do because there are so many emotions. I remember uh, in, uh, doing a, a study with with Patrick Spence and Ken Lachlan and, and Matt Seeger and Steve Bennett right after 9-11 and, and watching the results come in and we noticed how, how angry uh, uh, some men in general tended to be and, and how concerned after 9-11 uh, women tended to be. And, and this, I'm not, you know, this is, these were just how the data came out and we tried to understand, well, well that was a simplistic uh, 
approach, but what, what, what are the other emotions? What are the nuances? And there's a, a lot more research being done on that. Uh, and, and I think we need to, to understand, it's not my specialization. I believe it's, it's valuable. I understand that, that the messages that we create and that we design create different emotions. I'm very interested in that, in that work, but uh, I think there's some, some fascinating work done on emotions and, 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 their, and their meaning done just down the Brooklyn Wayne State University at Michigan State. There's some of those crisis scholars have done some remarkable work on, on emotion. Um, again, I'm cutting across a few questions and um, for the attendees, um, I may not fully get to your question, but I'm trying to um, see if there are some similarities. Um, so the question would be um, regarding uh, planning for the, or prediction about the next pandemic, because you mentioned there might be or there will be, and then how do you plan for it and the role of uh, communicators and communication in, in planning? So prediction of next pandemics and then the planning for them. Well, you know, when you, when you talk about chaos theory, I started with bifurcation, but some models start with fractals and you're always trying to understand fractals and, and predict the bifurcation. And so the best thing that we can do is, is have information and share that information. I don't think that we did a great job with SARS. I think we did a, a uh, in, in terms of getting the data and communicating it. And there, there are a lot of criticism there. I think that things were a little better with, with MERS. Uh, the, the second of these, uh, of these uh, similar diseases similar to, to COVID-19. With COVID-19, there was information. There was, there was taught. And to try to claim that, that we didn't have information, that's politically disputed, but actually pretty clear. That, that a lot of countries had time and, and what, is the, what, is the, uh, what is the support for that? Well, we look at what happened in New Zealand and response and, and how effective that was. And we look at what's happened in, in countries that didn't respond as quickly or, 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 or however you want to put that. So always, always the, the, the way of planning is to get better distribution of information and, that's, and, and to have plans in place. It was, it was in, in Gosh, I think it was 2005, the CDC sponsored us to, to do pandemic training in, an, in every major city in the United States. Uh, Matt Seeger was a part of that. I was a part of that. Uh, but we, we went from city to city and, and did training developed by Barbara Reynolds, uh, who's a, a real leader in, in emergency risk communication from the CDC. And we shared that information. And the plans exist and they were ready to go. But we also have to understand the political nature of things. And, and that's always gonna be a limitation. So I think the plans are there. I do hope that next time people will take it seriously, will respond more quickly, and we can stop uh, the, the next epidemic in, in this tracks or stop it from spreading. Let's contrast what's going on with COVID-19 right now, trying to, to downplay it. And, but when you look at, at the, at the, the uh, the Ebola crisis and, and how some of the people who are claiming that that COVID-19 is not a big deal were claiming that that the United States would soon be overrun by Ebola. So it just they, the, the you know, politi you know the political ramifications of talking about disease and planning for it is something that's out of my hands. I mean, I can't control that, but I can make sure that, that countries have a plan and that they get the information and that they have in place at least the initial steps. Thanks. Um, some questions about social media, uh, perhaps thinking about social media from the perspective of chaos theory, maybe self-organizing and so on, and uh, it's positive uh, impacts, it's negative impacts. Social media, I think uh, uh, it, it's, a lot of time talking about this today and, and, and clearly social media is, is, is here to stay and it's up to us to make good use of it. I think uh, Glenn Noah made some interesting comments. Glenn is someone that was actually oversaw the, the public communication for CDC in, in several different aspects, particularly with, with vaccination and inoculation. Uh, it's a fascinating work and now he's at the University of Georgia uh, in, in working on their, with some of their, their centers and things. And 
And he talked a lot about how the message needs to be shared, but we need to understand how on social media that, that all of the things that are, everything that's shared is not necessarily a problem. It's something that Tim Coombs at Sherry Holiday would call paradoxes and that people are talking about it, but it's not gonna get the kind of, of, uh, of support that it changes people's behavior. Uh, we, do, we do so much work with Twitter and how many, how many people say things on Twitter, but Twitter is such a vast resource that we don't know. We can't really understand all of it. And we can do anything we want to, as, as uh, Glenn was explaining to the class today, because we can look at, there are so many tweets, we can, we can find patterns that, that may or may not be meaningful. But social media is, in, is, in, is important in many ways. And I, I go back to the, to the, the social media crisis communication model, where social media is a part of that, that opinion leadership. There are people who are interpersonal opinion leaders who get their information from social media. So we need to, uh, to address them. We may not there, be, be speaking to the people that we want to have actually engage in the change, but we may be speaking to the people who bring that information to them. So while I don't think that, that social media has replaced traditional media uh, or, or replaced the kind of interaction that a doctor patient has, I do think that, that we need to look at all three together, that, that interaction with agencies, traditional communication, new media, and our existing uh, public health system. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, it's a longish uh, question, but I'm gonna read it uh, verbatim. Uh, during the current health crisis, institutional knowledge and plans were ignored or lost due to leadership, organizational turnover, resources, among others, which limits reactions and provides a need for reflection and evaluation. How can self-organizing and emerging leadership tap into established institutional knowledge and work with them so we don't reinvent the wheel and engage change? That's a, it's a, it's a really in, important issue. There's a, there's a group at the University of Central Florida in the emergency management area. Ayim uh, Kooch uh, is a person that's done a, a great deal of research there and he talks a lot about how our traditional networks that are funded by systems, they're the groups that, that we are, are supported by our organizations, uh, by our, our governments, are essential to responding to crises, disasters, and, and things like this. However, uh, there are also emergent networks, networks of, of emergent leadership, and some of these organizations that I mentioned about, that about Morgan Getchell's writing and her addressing of chaos theory as, as being resolved by emergent organizations. The question that they're asking in the emergency management cluster in a collaborative learning group is how do these two networks come together? When do they come together? And what is the synergistic benefit? They're particularly interested in how in failures in leadership or, or inadequacies in leadership that might occur uh, due to a, a traditional network, and that's, these are my words, not theirs, so uh, I'm the one that's using the word inadequacy, but how that can, how any void created can be filled by these emergent networks and how they come together synergistically, and that is some fascinating research. I, I know that there's some work done, uh, Michelle Schumade has done some of this work, Amy O'Connor, they've worked together and, and they've come up with some sort of a strategic communication explanation for how these networks come together and networking can, can be reach these strategic communication objectives, including uh, in, in ways that are, are less formal and that are more inviting. So that's what I see is some opportunity, recognition of these, of these networks that can come together and, and form the kind of synergy that it takes to, to address these wicked problems. What about uh, lack of uh, full information in the uh, case of COVID-19? Uh, like we don't know about the vaccine and the test and so on. Um, so how should this uncertainty be acknowledged and how does this impact the credibility of uh, authorities? That's a, you know, it, of course it affects credibility and, and so one of the, the ways that, that I like that I've seen this written about in a, in a positive way is, is by through dialectical tensions. 
And I know Robert Littlefield has just published an article in the uh, Journal of International Crisis and Risk Communication Research, uh, an important journal, open access, anybody can look at that journal. But his article focuses on his theory of dialectical tensions and crisis. And we've got these tensions that, of, of certainty and uncertainty. And it's a tension because we want to share all that we know because the void will be filled with misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, disruptive information. So we know that this tension exists. We know that it will be feel, but we know that, that, that we've got to resolve it. But we have to, to simply recognize and accept that tension and consider our strategies for dealing with it, getting as much information out to as many people as possible, as consistently as possible, endorsed by as many agencies seen as credible by the organizations as possible. And to do that, consistently and quickly. And the last thing I'd say is the, is the maxim that we all go by in crisis communication, and that is when you have the ear of publics, you tell them what you know, you admit what you don't know, and you tell them what you're doing to find out what you don't know and when you're gonna get more information to them. Well, hopefully that'll be on a regular basis. Okay. Um. Let me, I'm trying to pick one that maybe we haven't uh, covered. Uh, maybe about the role of theories. Um, you mentioned about uh, idea theory and um, a, a couple of other theories uh, other than chaos theory. Um, how much would you, s or what, what do you see the role of uh, theories in terms of their advantages and disadvantages uh, to understanding uh, crises and especially uh, infectious disease uh, crises? I think the advantage of theory is that it, it, it's a very public discussion about what we call a recurring system state. We can look at these diseases and the problems that they produce, and they're going to continue to produce problems like this. This isn't, this isn't going away. This isn't like a, a one-off event. We will have events that's more serious than we've known in our life, but it, it's going to continue to happen. So theory looks at these consistent system states, creates a conversation, gives us an opportunity to have a global discussion. We're able to talk about the same units that interact in the same way and that we can come up with prediction and solutions that are meaningful and that are reliable and valid. So that's, that's beautiful. But what is a problem with theory? And that was one of the questions, one of the, I think it's a problem if we try to force a theory that doesn't fit. It's a problem if we try to, to adapt a theory to, 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 fit what we, to make something happen uh, and, and that we want to see happen. Or I think it's better if we get complacent and we think that the same one, two, maybe three theories can explain everything. I, I think we should be open as those who engage in theory to listening to others who want to push the boundaries of theory or propose a new theory. I think we should listen to that and, and pay attention and not be afraid that somebody is going to come up with a theory that's better than one that, that I've been a part of. But engage in that. If, we, if we're open and willing to, to see the theorizing process in, in, in full motion with crisis and, and risk communication, then all we're going to see is new solutions that better address uh, the ever-evolving nature of crises. Um, I'm putting some my, my some of my own words into this question. Um, so there are different systems of understanding of the world. So there's a scientific uh, worldview, and there may be what we would call cultural practices or religious practices worldview that uh, help us understand uh, when steady states are no longer steady states. Uh, sometimes these uh, worldviews can collide. Um, do you have any uh, comments on how to negotiate that collision between, say, established traditional cultural worldviews and more scientific worldviews when it comes to these sorts of medical crises that clearly have a scientific solution? Well, you know, I, I really believe that, that the, the person who asked the question about listening, their thoughts are relevant here too, that we, that we should never stop listening and that we have to realize that, that all of the views that are shared to us do not necessarily coincide with those that, that, 
that we feel are paramount, but these are the views that, that guide our behaviors. And when I look at, at from a theoretical perspective, I think the, the risk information seeking and processing model, for example, tells us that we need to, to engage in systematic thinking about complex objects or complex issues rather than heuristic thinking or simply uh, we hear the word, uh, we hear, 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 hear the name of a particular religion and all of a sudden we have a complete understanding of that person. That's a heuristic or a systematic way of thinking is when we would, are, are able to seek information, listen to people, come to understand what's going on in the minds of others and how that's, that's, that's leading to their behavior and, and how that might be a, a chance for us to see a unification in our ideas. Maybe there's a strange attractor, maybe there is a transcendent value that links us together even though from a quick thought, heuristic sense, we seem divided. This is something that Paul Slovak would describe as from the perspective of thinking fast and thinking slow. He would say we need to slow our thinking down and consider all the perspectives, all the needs that, that, that are, are at stake. And that's the key. Um, I think uh, we'll uh, stop uh, with the Q&A right now. Um, I know uh, there are a few questions that were maybe left unanswered. Um, but feel free to send an email to Dr. Selnow and he'll be very happy to answer them. I can speak for him. He'll be very happy to answer that <laughs> like he's been doing for me. Uh, uh, but Dr. Selnow, if you had any uh, last uh, comments or thoughts and then uh, we can end after that. And I'm just grateful for all of you who have, have taken the time to listen to this tonight and those of you who engage in, in the, the theorizing process and the discovery process about risk and crisis because this is a line of research where if we do it right and if we are successful, people who would have suffered or would have died will not suffer and will live. And this is, a, this is very meaningful work and I commend you for committing yourselves to it. Thank you again, Dr. Selna. Uh... Thanks everybody. <laughs>